All right. So, uh, well, good morning to everybody, um, and good good afternoon to our Australian friends. Um, my name is is Michael Vigel. I work as the as the program director um, of the Global Security Research Program at, at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, and it's my great pleasure to to chair this this webinar, um, in which we will we'll we'll discuss. Um, Comprehensive security and 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 uh, and particularly perhaps security of supply um, from a sort of comparative uh, perspective, um, specifically comparing the structures and and, and practices in in Australia, um, Finland, and, and and Sweden, and uh, all these three countries are 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 so-called enhanced opportunities partners uh, of NATO, and 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 even in that category. Um, I think it's fair to say that that these three countries are by far uh, NATO's closest and and most most valued partners. Um, all three countries are also often looked upon as um, exemplary cases of uh, resilience building, um, a term in much vogue right now, as we know, in security planning and discourse. Um, and they all three provide excellent examples of um, what what has been called or what we call uh, whole of society approaches um, to security, another another related concept very pertinent right now uh, in security planning as well. Um, and before present presenting our speakers, I'd I'd like to take the opportunity to flag uh, a very fresh, a very recent report, and uh, that two of my colleagues, Harry Mikkola and Tapio Juntunen, together my, with myself. Um, Produced for the European Parliament um, on best practices of uh, the whole of society approach, uh, encountering hybrid threats, in which we specifically compare uh, Finland, Sweden, and Australia, um, and on on that basis, on this comparative perspective, uh, we make some some recommendations uh, for the EU how to strengthen uh, resilience building within the EU um, specifically with a view to hybrid threats. And, and I think you'll now find a link to that report in the chat function, should you be interested, interested in that. Um, now let me let me introduce our, our excellent speakers in today's webinar. Sari Rautio um, provide, will provide some, some opening remarks. Um, Sari Rautio serves as the Director for Security uh, Policy and Crisis Management at the Finnish uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And she has uh, previously held the position of director for EU's common uh, foreign and security policy in Helsinki, and she's been deputy representative of, of Finland um, to the EU political and security committee in, in Brussels. Then we'll have uh, Professor Rory Metcalf providing the Australian uh, perspective. Rory Metcalf is, is uh, the head of the National Security College at the Australian National University, um, and he's the, the founding director of the International Security Program at the Lowy uh, Institute. And at FIA, we're of course very happy to, to that he recently became a member of our, our uh, advisor, advisory, scientific advisory council, as it's called. Um, the Swedish perspective uh, will then be given by Jan Olof Olofsson. Um, he's an executive officer at the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency, the, the, uh, the MSB, um, and he's the MSB representative in various international working groups uh, within the field of, of, of security of supply and, and, and critical infrastructure. And lastly, Christian Fieder um, will provide his remarks on, on the Finnish um, comprehensive security uh, model um, and Finnish security of supply, perhaps. Uh, Christian is the director um, of policy planning and analysis at the, at the uh, National Emergency Supply Agency in Finland. He's also a steering group member of the OECD High Risk Level, uh, high, high, high Level Risk Forum, I think it's called, uh, and he has previously worked for for Nokia and Nokia Siemens uh, networks in the fields of risk management and, and business continuity management. And he also holds a PhD from the University of Sydney, um, so he's, he's, he has had some first-hand uh, experience from from Australia as well. Um, and before handing over to Sari, I'd, I'd like to just to, to remind everybody to, to, to keep your speakers on mute uh, throughout and, and, and that any questions 
and comments uh, can be posted in the chat function. We only we will only deal with those questions, so, so please put them there. Uh, remarks, comments, questions in the chat function, and, and we'll make sure that we'll have we have some time left towards the end um, of this this webinar to, to to discuss discuss any questions and comments and so on and forth. So uh, so and with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Sari for for her remarks. Mm. Thank you, Mika. Thank you. Thanks to Fia for organizing uh, this event. Uh, it is, of course, a great pleasure to to open this webinar. And, and a very interesting uh, topic today, the three countries, Australia, Sweden, Finland, our, our viewpoints on economic resilience have actually much in common, uh, despite the geographic distance. Uh, we share many interests as liberal economies and democracies uh, with deep depend dependence on global trade, free flow of goods and services and the rules based international system. Also, the word resilience has actually become a key word in, in security policy and, and uh, building those uh, policies whose aim is to strengthen security in different ways. Uh, economic resilience is, of course, necessary for prosperity of societies, but it is also a prerequisite for security of supply and to societal resilience more broadly. And societal resilience in its turn is key in countering malign interference of all kinds, like hybrid threats. So there's a realization that security of any nation or, or uh, an alliance requires resilience that is built over a long stretch of time through various approaches. Uh, this in addition to defensive and offensive capabilities. Well, as has been demonstrated by COVID-19, uh, the global value and supply chains uh, constitute lifelines uh, to our economies. So the continuity of these flows pose a common challenge to our national security and resilience. All the three countries in question today, uh, Australia, Sweden, and Finland, also share same vulnerabilities and risks to the critical flows. They include also certain risks related to communication networks. There has been a lot of discussion over there or around the 5G networks. How, what are the risks entailed? How they can be mitigated? Uh, there are risks related to subsea uh, cables, uh, maritime traffic, but also uh, the risks uh, that, that relate to plainly hostile operations like cyber operations, just to name a few. Um, well, the three countries present today uh, are, are also known to excel in different partly overlapping areas of resilience that, that Mikael was just referring to that, and that we will be hearing of uh, today. And we can, of course, learn from each other. Personally, it, it, was, a, um, it was quite a moment of, of um, even surprise a few years ago when I understood how much uh, we actually share, for example, with Australia and what comes to understanding and countering hybrid threats or, or the kind of the hybrid threats landscape that we face. And even though we are geographically as far apart as, as countries can be from each other, we actually face very similar kinds of uh, hybrid threats and we can definitely learn a lot from each other and we, we have learned uh, from each other. On the other hand, uh, Finland and Sweden that are close neighbors and partners share very similar kind of comprehensive approach uh, to security. What is interesting also is that, uh, and, and as Mikael just mentioned, uh, the three countries uh, that are present today uh, are all NATO's enhanced opportunities partners. And, and so we have an opportunity to address the questions of uh, resilience also together within uh, the framework of, of the NATO partnership and with NATO allies. And it's also interesting how the resilience agenda has, ra has raised in, in, the, in the NATO more broad security agenda during the last years. And I think the COVID-19 uh, lifted it up even further very quickly. Uh, the same is true for the EU's security agenda, both the security and defense agenda, but more broadly EU's approach to, to security uh, at large. Well, their, their threats uh, landscape evolves uh, constantly um, and their global health crisis revealed certain vulnerabilities. So that really emphasizes to need 
to reach even across oceans to collaborate with like-minded partners uh, like we are doing today uh, with, uh, with Australia. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, the pandemic also has made it clear for us that, that it's actually not so difficult to keep these contacts and, and uh, do things together. Well, today's event uh, will really provide a chance to share best practices, to continue the dialogue, and let's hope this is also a start of something. Uh, it's not a one-off, and, and the digital leap really helps us to to continue these discussions as we are not uh, tied to a time and a place we, we can do this digitally. So uh, thank you and looking forward to the discussions. Thanks a lot, Sari, and, and thanks for, we, I think we actually heard heard most of it. You, you, were, you were away just for a very, very, very short while, so, so no worries about that. And thanks for pointing out also the many, many commonalities between these countries, because I think really there, there are there are many, many commonalities, and we definitely share a very similar kind of, of threat landscape, and 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 uh, which we don't all, always think about here up in the north, when, uh, that we we share many things with Australia, in fact, and that we can learn much much from each other. But let let me now give give the word to 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 Rory and and, and the, the the Australian perspective. Yeah, go ahead. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to join you over the oceans for this. Um, for this discussion. Uh, I'm going to begin by, uh, I guess, reminding colleagues in Europe that uh, Australia, uh, Australians have, have had a certain self-image over the years uh, of a country that did not need to worry too much about national security, about national resilience and, and, and survival. There was this self-image, if you like, over the last 20 or 30 years of, uh, of a country that was uh, doing very well economically, that was focused very much on lifestyle, on engagement with the Asian region, uh, a place that uh, was known for its no worries attitude, democracy, love of sport, uh, and a, a booming economy. And of course, a lot of this had an element of mythology to it. And I think the the important starting point for this conversation is to say that over the past five years, uh, Australia has really quite comprehensively moved away from that sense of taking a, a holiday from history. Uh, and perhaps much of the world has only become aware in the past year or two of how far Australia has travelled towards a, um, a place of, of greater national security preparedness. That's been driven in part by the challenges Australia has had in its relationship with China, but I would argue it's also related to a number of other risks, such as climate-related risks, risks related to uh, the, the environment, resources, and of course, the shock of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I do think that we have a, a conversation to be had in common. I'd also note that many of the the terms that we've already heard about resilience and preparedness and whole of nation or whole of society engagement in, um, I guess, national security or protecting the national interest. These are also entering the Australian debate, uh, but there's a particular challenge, set of challenges in the Australian context. I think Australian governments are still trying to come to terms with some, some very special contradictions in our situation. On the one hand, of course, Australia has uh, an enormous geographic space to take an interest in, a very large uh, territory, very large maritime zones of interest, and a relatively small population, uh, 25 million people. Australia also, uh, we have to remember, is a federation, and we've rediscovered the character of our federation in the past year as we've sought to respond to the pandemic. So you will see, for example, lockdowns within and between Australian states uh, that often uh, are considerably more forceful than what we're seeing perhaps uh, in many other parts of the world outside, uh, outside perhaps China. So Australia faces a particular challenge in mobilising to ensure that the sum of our capabilities is at least as large as uh, the very many parts. The Commonwealth or federal government, the state governments and territory governments, the private sector and civil society and so forth. Um, Australia also 
is a country which on the one hand has a very strong tradition of uh, volunteering in civil society, but not a strong tradition of national service. Indeed, the idea of national service in any kind of military sense has been uh, really uh, anathema to Australians since the early 1970s, since the, the Vietnam War. So we're still facing a situation where it's difficult, if you like, to mobilise in a democratic framework um, a large part of our population to one end. Uh, Australia has this unusual character of being a, a US ally uh, in the Indo-Pacific, but also a country that uh, faces a large set of national security expectations itself. For example, a provider of security and governance and stability support in our own region in the, the South Pacific. And finally, uh, Australia is, if, if you like, in many ways, uh, a great experiment of a, uh, a developed multicultural liberal democracy in the Indo-Pacific, in the region that is increasingly the centre of geopolitical contestation uh, in, in the world. And I think we're beginning to discover, in, to discover in recent years what that means for our own domestic security and domestic polity, particularly around the issue of foreign interference. So. <clears throat> Just to set the scene, Australia comes to this conversation uh, with some very distinct circumstances. And in all of this, I think we've seen a journey of over the past five years towards what I would call a more comprehensive hardening of Australia's national security outlook conducted in a liberal democratic context in uh, a federal and, and multicultural uh, system but a, uh, a pretty dramatic move, all set of, set of moves all the same to prepare the country for what I would call a decade of disruption. Uh, so to give you a few examples of priorities that are now being pursued in Australia, you could argue that in this country, we're looking for a model of resilience and national cohesion that can be adapted to multiple risks and threats, not only for example, uh, great power coercion, and in this case, of course, that's really a conversation about China, but also uh, terrorism and violent extremism, uh, military contingencies and economic coercion, threats to cyber systems and critical infrastructure, uh, the impact of climate change and natural disasters, uh, but also other transnational risks like COVID-19. So I think the conversation we're still having in this country is how do we build a national response to these risks, uh, which is in some ways coherent and mutually supporting, uh, because of course we can't afford to develop, if you like, boutique strategies for each of these often uh, seemingly very different risks. And doing this with a country that is on the one hand, the world's 13th largest economy, uh, a substantial developed nation, but a country where ultimately our national interests are much larger than our own national capabilities. In other words, we need to focus on alliances and partnerships and to use more than uh, simply the resources of, uh, of, of the federal government. Uh, so I want to emphasize that this is a many year journey. It's not simply something that's happened in the last 12 months. And just to give you a few examples of the elements of this new strategy of national security and national preparedness, uh, firstly, of course, there is a defence uh, element to this, a modernisation of the Australian Defence Force that we've seen with an increased focus on the maritime domain and on not only the ability to shape our strategic environment, but to deter and respond to a wide range of contingencies. And the challenge there, of course, is that Australia uh, does not pretend that single-handedly our Defence Force can deal with all of these contingencies. It's very much about working with allies and partners. The foreign policy dimension to Australia's uh, new strategy of preparedness, and that is focused at one level on building creative new partnerships in the Indo-Pacific region. And this, of course, is a, a redefinition of a maritime Asia-centric region uh, that Australia has been very prominent in driving. Uh, so you see relationships like the quadrilateral security dialogue with India, Japan and the United States. You see new partnerships with other Asian countries. You see uh, new cultivation of strategic partnerships with European powers as well. Uh, Australia is not putting all of its eggs into one basket, so to speak, in foreign policy. Economically, uh, and indeed 
in terms of geoeconomics, there's a recognition in Australia now that all of the the good and the wonderful uh, advantages and benefits we've received from a globalised system, uh, from free trade that Australia has long advocated, uh, comes with vulnerabilities and risks as well that we now need to manage. So there is a fresh focus in Australia in recent years on the protection of critical infrastructure, on the screening of foreign investment on national security grounds, and of course, the Australian uh, decision on 5G uh, back in 2018 uh, was something of a global landmark event, that focus on allowing only trusted vendors into our uh, into our future 5G networks. Uh, but it's not the only area of critical, inf critical infrastructure where Australia has now taken a much firmer position. And all of this, I should add, is underpinned by, frankly, uh, an avalanche of legislation. Uh, the Australian Parliament has been very busy in the past five years on national security legislation. Elsewhere on the economic dimension, uh, there is now a new emphasis on trade diversification. This is much easier said than done. And on the one hand, uh, we are not seeking to uh, end our economic relationship with China. It is our largest trading partner. It's mutually beneficial and we want to keep it that way. But Australia being the subject of Chinese economic coercion over the past year, has really um, crystallised thinking in our policy community and indeed in our business community about the need for trade diversification. Uh, on supply, and I know supply chain security is a big focus of this conversation, I think the Australian conversation has been somewhat different. Uh, there is still only a relatively uh, small emphasis on, for example, uh, domestic production, domestic manufacturing, uh, but there is a new focus on diversification of supply chains and the use of new essentially strategic or geopolitical partners like the quadrilateral relationship uh, as, as potentially uh, future insurance for supply chain security. Um, look, three brief points before I, I, I wrap up this introduction. Uh, three areas where I think the Australian example is uh, worthy of greater focus. One is disaster risk and resilience. The second is critical infrastructure and the third is foreign interference. Uh, so, to, so to give you a few data points on those three examples, uh, disaster risk and resilience Australia has been through uh, a very challenging situation in the past two years. Just before COVID-19 hit the world, we were already uh, enduring uh, a major disaster, a set of natural disasters climate-induced disasters, if you like, uh, the so-called black, black summer of bushfires, uh, forest fires, I guess, in, in your parlance uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and just to give a quick uh, understanding of that, the amount of Australian territory, Australian bushland that was burnt in those fires, more than 24 million hectares, uh, that's about 71% uh, of Finland's entire land area, and I know that in European terms, Finland is a big country. So this was an enormous, uh, an enormous disaster. Uh, Canberra at times had, I think, the worst air quality in the world, which is uh, quite extraordinary to think about. But just to emphasise that uh, a extreme event of catastrophic bushfires has, uh, if you like, generated a pretty comprehensive national response, uh, the establishment of a national uh, recovery and Resilience Agency or Resilience and Recovery, Agen recovery Agency, uh, new private-public partnerships on resilience and on, if you like, uh, hardening communities against future risks, uh, changes, fundamental changes to the way in which the Australian government, the federal government relates to the states and territories, national emergency powers uh, that previously did not exist. And this was, if you like, just the beginning, because of course, uh, then COVID-19 hit. And so the, if you like, the rearrangement of Australia's policy architecture to ensure that the federal government and the state governments could coordinate much more strongly on national security grounds was accelerated during the pandemic response. On critical infrastructure, uh, again, a, uh, a pretty powerful uh, set of uh, new laws in recent years. Uh, essentially empowering the government to designate uh, fairly much any system uh, on suitable grounds to be national infrastructure and to impose certain obligations 
on private sector actors to uh, to work with government to protect those assets. Uh, those laws are in the process of being tightened further still, and so we will see, for example, soon, I suspect, uh, positive security obligations being put on um, the, uh, the owners or operators of critical infrastructure assets to essentially take responsibility for their own cyber security and to uh, engage the government uh, automatically uh, if, there is a, if there is a cyber security incident. On foreign interference, the, th the third of the three examples that I think are worthy of greater study uh, in the Australian experience, uh, our uh, security intelligence organisation, ASIO, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, I guess it's the, it's the Australian SUPO, as they have in, in Finland, um, reports annually now on the levels of the foreign interference threat. This has become a much more serious consideration in Australian policy in the past five years. And it's no secret to say that uh, a large amount of this concern relates to the behaviour of uh, the Chinese Communist Party inside Australia. One of the distinct challenges we have here as a multicultural democracy is ensuring that Australians of all backgrounds, including the 1.2 million Australians of Chinese origin, have equal rights to freedom of expression uh, and to all democratic freedoms under Australian law. That was being jeopardised uh, by a number of documented acts of, um, of foreign influence and interference. Uh, this remains a very controversial set of issues, but I think just to wrap up here, a large part of the Australian government response so far has been through law, uh, laws uh, defining and criminalising acts of foreign interference, laws requiring foreign agents to register publicly uh, when they're conducting, if you like, acts of influence, perfectly legitimate acts of influence, but acts that should be conducted under, um, under transparency. And finally, uh, new laws obliging state governments to now uh, ensure that they coordinate with, um, with Canberra, with the federal government, when they enter into arrangements with foreign powers. Uh, it sounds at one level uh, harsh. It sounds as if, as if Australia is securitising these issues, but at another level, I think uh, the Australian political uh, system, I think both major political parties in Australia recognise that we have allowed vulnerabilities to persist for too long. And in many ways, we're trying to reset a number of our foreign relations uh, from a position of national interest. Uh, the risk that I'll close with in all of this, of course, is that uh, as a multicultural democracy, we need to bring diverse communities along with us on this journey. And it's fair to say that there is work yet to be done to reassure Australians of Chinese origin that this is um, very much about protecting their rights. I'll pause there, but I hope I've provided a number of uh, points of departure for our conversation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rory. This was a great, great and uh, comprehensive overview of the of the Australian situation. So thanks, thanks a lot for that. Uh, and uh, let's now move on to the to the Swedish perspective and 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 Jan Olaf Olsson. Thank you. <clears throat> the civil preparedness and emergency planning are two other words of what is entitled civil defence in Swedish. Civil de defence is basically about the inherent resilience, resilience and ability to of society as a whole to deal with serious crises, including an armed attack. Social security and comprehensive defense in Sweden is based on a general and all of society approach. That is all government agencies, municipalities, private companies. In one way, also the people in Sweden has a role in a total defense. The principle is that the responsibility during crisis should lie with those who in the day-to-day -day business is conducting the business. Sweden has always had a great confidence in international trade, partly because we cannot produce all goods, partly because international trade is a prerequisite for getting the value of our own assets. Ever since science, the Vikings trade journeys type of international trade has been an important to Sweden. Throughout history, the importance of borders has varied, and we are now in a situation where in Sweden have realized that we are one in the periphery of the world, and that we are depending on many and long sophisticated logistic chains. 
And I want to uh, empathize all the benefits of international trade, but the markets have major weakness. It's bad at crisis preparedness. The dependence on a free and open market, market was a major reason for EU membership for Sweden. On the other hand, the Swedish ability to always follow all the rules has given a naivety, a naivety in not daring to question the ability of the free market. Many parts of the society identify themselves as critical and conduct business continuity work and so on, but they are also dependent on many others who don't have a robust or resilient process. And then social vital function realize their weakness when the truck suddenly one day does not back into the loading dock. We have too much just in time and need to have more just in case mindset all over the society. Here comes the weakness with the cornerstone of Swedish approach to societal security. That it is assumed that everyone has the ability to deliver their goods, their services and goods especially to those who are important to society. The Swedish societal, societal security and comprehensive defense is based on everyone securing their part of the society. But if different authorities or actors not ensure their function, it poses a great risk and through all addiction, it poses a great risk of cascading effects as we may not have an overview of all of supply chains. Various sectors, environmental consideration and economic governance can con contract good crisis preparedness. For many parts, there is also an expectation that everything will always work, which means that understanding the need to take one's own responsibility is low. Three years ago, MSB sent out a brochure on whether the crisis of war is coming to increase citizens' awareness that they must be prepared. We have now begun a corresponding information campaign for the business community, but we must maneuver carefully to limit the market impact. Of course, we have studied various NES tools NESA uses in this work. Society have been developed through, for example, globalization and digitalization, which means that we are becoming increasingly interconnected, while at the same time constantly striving for efficiency. Social with vital functions have been privatized and are in some cases Finnish owned and even in what we would say foreign ownership. That's for example for the Swedish space industry, pulp and paper, energy and so on. The development has resulted in neglect of safety aspects while society's vulnerability has increased in several areas. Even service that are is, is identified as important and robust are dependent on other suppliers and services that do not have the robustness that the important service requires. When they continue in several stages, so there are many components that lack basic robustness, but which are prerequisites for many very important functions. The society is working hard on all levels to strengthen the emergency preparedness and civil defense in Sweden now. The pace has increased in the planning and measures have been taken in accordance with the government's intentions. Still a lot of work remains to ensure a well-functioning total defense. Defensive investments are needed to make society more robust. Throughout analyze, we identify serious vulnerabilities that will require clear priorities and extensive investments over time. Increased robustness in infrastructure such as bridges, ports, railways, junctions, depots, power supply and communication system are necessary. During the pandemic, our regional healthcare system suffered from a fact that healthcare providers was too small players when they were launched into the strain world market. The wholesalers were not prepared to be able to shift up, including prioritizing their deliveries of goods. Structural conditions for society's emergency preparedness and civil defense need to be put in place. Clear management and collaboration structures are a prerequisite for society's emergency preparedness and civil defense. 
to some extent this is missing today. The gray zone is usually understood as a state between peace and war. The gray zone creates a number of challenges for the crisis preparedness and the total defense. The special regulations for the civil defense we have in Sweden are not activated until a state of heightened alert is declared. The crisis preparedness actors, also the civil defense actors, thus have to plan for handling the gray zone in the context of a peacetime as well as wartime regulations. The way gray zone threats can be met is primarily through non-military countermeasures. Some of those countermeasures aim at increasing the ability to maintain the functionality of society, not, the loss, not at least the energy supply. Robust supply systems increase the resilience of society and raise the thresholds for aggressions of military as well as gray zones character. An increased understanding of the vulnerability of the societal functions is needed in order to be able to increase robustness, which in turn requires increased knowledge on specific sectors. The design of strategies and measures to handle gray zone problems should be integrated with peacetime contingency planning, as well as the planning for total defense during heightened alert and war. It's easy to prepare for the last crisis. It's important to step back and have an all hazard approach, and that's essential. The societal resilience approach to risk management approach and based on citizens' responsibility. There are many suppliers, both in production and all sides, who have a crisis awareness. But since much supply and products are commercial off the shelf, we are dependent on many suppliers who do not feel that responsibility or have the necessary capability during crisis. This makes the Swedish system vulnerable. Since then, the COVID-19 crisis has shown that many entrepreneurs can quickly scale up and reorganize production. Many new manufacturers of protective aprons in the plastic industry is a great example from the last year. The awareness of crisis preparedness and all dependencies has increased during COVID-19. And a lot of happening, a lot is happening in the industry. Many contractors see new business opportunities, while many who are dependent on goods and services secure their most important suppliers and weight the supplies' ability in their procurements. I believe that Sweden must identify what is really important, analyze its supply chains, and secure them. For other parts that are a little high up higher up in the Maslow's pyramid, do we have to accept, accept that it does not work in all situations? So that was what I was prepared to say. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Janov, for, for, for giving us the, the Swedish perspective. And, and we're moving on to, to the Finnish comprehensive model now and, and, and Christian's remarks. OK. Uh, things are acting a bit funny here, but like, like I said, there's a couple of illustrations that I, I think actually work quite well in terms of also picking up points that my colleagues made there and and, and pointing out, like I said, the differences that um, we actually have here in, in Finland. And if we think in terms of uh, geography, um, first of all, externally, much like what you, Rory, and, and Jan Ola have already pointed out as well, Finland also has this sort of deep sense of periphery. And, and deep fear of isolation. It's not like in historically in Australia, sort of um, certainly a distance type of feeling, but nonetheless, we have been somewhat isolated from in the historical times where we're part of Sweden from, from Sweden proper uh, and in the European context from the European um, mainland. So in, in, in lots of ways, um, you know, this sort of sense of separation um, it has, has shaped the way we think. And unfortunately, in, in the history, it has also meant that geopolitics has played a major significant role in that um, in geography. And, and, and Finland has various times been in the sort of center of conflict. And I think it's fair to say that whenever conflict arises in the region, it somehow involves Finland, or either directly or indirectly. Uh, but nonetheless, always has implications to Finland in, 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 in some ways that are not 
not not positive. Uh, internally, geography has meant that, like uh, Rory pointed out, in European terms, we're actually a fairly large country, especially a fairly long country. Um, and at the same time, much like Australia as well, and, 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 and partially also Sweden, uh, population destiny here is, is extremely low. So uh, it basically means there's long distances between different population centers and, and, and different points of, for instance, critical infrastructures. Um, all in all, this means that connectivity has, has, has played a significant role. The importance of connectivity has played a significant role in, 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 in the way of the Finnish approach to comprehensive security and especially uh, security supply. Um, also, much like Sweden and Australia, uh, we, we also very dependent on global markets and the global value and supply chains that uh, act as engines and highways of those markets. Uh, Finnish economy is extremely dependent on external trade. Um, and that dependency sort of culminates in this sort of geographical aspect of, of the Baltic Sea really being uh, the source of uh, lifelines for, for Finland. Approximately 80% of Finnish imports and 90% of Finnish exports actually uh, depend on maritime logistics in the, in the Baltic Sea. And, and given the fact that there has been a number of crises in the past in the Baltic Sea where there actually has been disruptions to these critical flows, obviously we're again in the situation where um, you know, this actually happening again in the future is a major concern. And, and I, I think this is very significant in, in regards to how the Finnish approach then may differ from even Sweden but especially uh, in, in regards to Australia in the sense uh, of especially um, emphasis on, on material preparedness. So we do have, for instance, um, imported fuel uh, stockpiles that are equivalent to five months of average uh, uh, consumption in, in Finland as, as opposed to what 11, 12 days in Australia and, and 90 days uh, in, in, in rest, rest of the IAEA countries, um, so you know, significantly more um, than than most other countries in any way, and and in lots of ways, this really just stems from this deep sense of vulnerability and 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 deep set fear of isolation from uh, from from Finland's um, neighbors and partners, um, and then. Again, unlike, for instance, in Australia and in more recent decades in, in, in Sweden, we never gave up uh, conscription. And, and sort of national defense, I think, is more perhaps a religion than, than a system. Uh, I, I think it would be fair to say that. And it does shape all our approaches to, to security, whether we're talking about uh, sort of hard security or, or soft security resilience or, 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 or just simply um, critical infrastructure protection or, or, or anything else. So it's kind of everything's kind of shaped by these these three different um, I, I think factors, uh, context, this deep sense of vulnerability and, and, and traditions uh, to um, relate to security. Um, I'm gonna just really quickly sort of um, show this picture as well. I'm not going to go into any depth uh, in terms of it. I just want to point out that um, this may be the source why I tend to cringe quite a bit when I'm asked to explain the Finnish approach even in 45 minutes, not to mention 10 minutes. Uh, it is sometimes comprehensive, sort of equals to uh, complex. And um, just to sort of point out that, in, like I said in the beginning also, that um, all three countries sort of share this notion of of, um, of uh, securing all vital societal functions against all hazards and utilizing uh, sort of a whole of society approach and that applies here as well. But we do have some differences. So uh, again, uh, we have this specific uh, security policy area for security of supply, uh, which is part of the comprehensive security approach and a significant part of it, uh, but at the same time also a little bit separate and and the sort of security supply uh, approach really um, entails 
sort of uh, ensuring the continuity of critical infrastructures, essential production and essential services. So it is also quite comprehensive in itself. And, and maybe this is sort of um, something that drives the main point uh, here is that uh, in overall, obviously the sort of objective is securing economies ability to produce wider products and services. And where this stems from is that fact that as I stated before that Finland is a liberal market economy and extremely dependent on external trade. So everything in, 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 in under normal circumstances depends on, on, on the markets and our access to the global markets and these global uh, value and supply chains that enable them. Um, of course, when there are exceptional circumstances, then you have to think in terms of what measures we can we can take in order to um, bring more resilience into the system, because unfortunately, as Jan Olof pointed out, um, the um, the private sector operators have often been uh, actually honestly chasing profit and 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 sort of had deep focus in in, in actually um, finding um, operational and and cost effectiveness more than maybe resilience. So there there needs to be a way to actually uh, also support. Uh, market functions and 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 and, and private uh, business uh, operating these vital services because most of the critical infrastructures and services are are are, are operated and and provided by uh, the private sector. And uh, critical infrastructures obviously are, are sort of the main highways within the country to deliver these vital services that we're trying to uh, ensure the continuity of. Uh, but then, like I said, this sort of significant difference in comparison to Australia and Sweden is, is this sort of ingrained focus on national defence. So whereas obviously the main priority is, is to ensure that the economy can and, and fulfil the needs, the essential needs of the population, um, our mission is also to ensure uh, the resourcing of national defence. Um, and because of the market, sort of um, the importance of the market operators, and as as Jan Olof sort of pointed out, it, you know this work is already started in Sweden as well, and is 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 a major priority there as well. Uh, we mostly rely really on a cooperative model uh, with the private sector, and this is the sort of way we have organised it. I'm not going to go into any depth in regards to this. Uh, but if you have a look at the, the the sort of the content of the boxes there, those are uh, industry-based uh, cooperative bodies that we call pools, where the significant players in the industry actually come together and share best practices on resilience, exercise, and so forth. So, you know, again, a very sort of comprehensive approach, very inclusive approach, and very market-based approach. But at the same time, again, driven by that see, uh, deep sense of vulnerability and 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 vulnerability to disruptions that actually may happen far from us. So it is not about just about the Baltic Sea region or connections to Europe, uh, but actually we have to somehow ensure connectivity globally uh, to these. Uh, services that are, are increasingly dependent on, on the global supply and value chains, even after COVID. And in, in lots of ways, actually, COVID proved this, that um, lots of countries tried these national approaches to sort of, and had this sense of, of sort of uh, self-sufficiency driven um, um, measures and, 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 and targets. That, and I think this is a false dichotomy. Uh, if we're in a global crisis, there's no way these sort of national um, uh, approaches will will actually work out in the long run. They may work out in the short run, but they are not sustainable. And this sort of relates to how we view as well um, strategic autonomy and self-sufficiency. They sort of ingrained in the mindset here, uh, but at the same time, we very sort of mindful of them and 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 and. You're very careful not to be 
completely driven by them because we we realized that our lifelines are actually our external connections and and that's what we need to uh, secure in in the long long run in order to be resilient um just to close off um i'm not going to be talking about some of the lessons learned and lessons to be learned from from covid uh, i think that might be actually a good point in the discussion uh, my colleagues referred to them a little bit uh, there's there's probably some comments i would like to make about them but um at this stage in in, in general in 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 con context of this story that i've been talking about uh obviously we have certain areas of strategic priorities and these are energy uh, digital security uh logistics and then especially in the in 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 recent times and partly driven by experiences from covid also the sort of local and regional level uh, preparedness that is something that we have not emphasized that much before but realized that uh, even though this sort of national approach to resilience is very important and quite effective people actually live in locations and and in towns and municipalities and if they are not resilient then the country can't be resilient but perhaps i'll leave leave it here and shape the rest to, to leave the rest to the discussion uh, just to sort of wrap up again the Finnish model has really been shaped by those experiences and in the in the past geography and geopolitics shape it quite a bit and traditions and again traditions especially in terms of this strong tradition of uh, national defense uh, that, that actually has a lot of influence in how how things shape here and the approach is truly comprehensive i think in good and bad i, I have to say that probably one of the um, lessons to be learned from covid is that uh, comprehensive shouldn't mean complicated uh, because complicated is vulnerable, more complex the system, the more sort of a probability or possibility there is that the system itself will be disrupted, and that's not good. But I leave it here. Thank you very much for the attention, and looking forward for the um, discussion. Cheers. Thanks a lot, Christian, for that overview of the Finnish Finnish model, so to speak. Um, I see no questions yet. I, I remind everybody you can put your questions and comments in the chat function. But uh, while we while we see whether while we wait for that, I'll I'll perhaps take the opportunity to to put to give one kind of short comment and and, and question as well here. I think it's interesting that when we think of the, the 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 countries in the world that that are applying this sort of whole of society approach and a comprehensive approach to security, there is often a critique that th th this could kind of securitize society and economy very much. And obviously there is the risk with that sort of, with this kind of whole of society approaches when you bring in civil society very much into the security discourse and the security planning. Uh, there is this risk of uh, more and more areas being kind of securitized and deemed as strategic uh, also in the economy and so on and forth. But still, when we look at the countries that actually are applying are the exempl example examples of this whole of society approach and the comprehensiveness, Australia, Finland, and Sweden, those are one of you know the, the, the sort of the most open uh, countries in the world in terms of the society and economy. So they, I, I don't really I don't see that much of a uh, that, that that's happening. But still, I mean, if we think about this, you know, these approaches now becoming hardened a bit in this new situation and being transferred to on other countries as well very much. Is there this risk of securitization and too much of areas being deemed strategic and securitized? So if you could perhaps uh, just comment a bit on that sort of thing, which I find a kind of an, an in, in, interesting thing to, 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 to contemplate a bit. I might begin, if you like, because um, the Australian experience is, is is quite distinct there. I think I I mentioned earlier that you know on the one hand uh, Australia is a liberal democracy with a strong tradition of of uh, volunteerism. Uh, so, for example, uh, during our natural disasters, we have state emergency services overwhelmingly comprising volunteers who do a lot of the hard work, a lot of the dangerous work, uh, whether it's fighting bushfires or floods or disaster relief. 
On the other hand, we don't have, since the early 1970s, uh, national service in our armed forces, and that would be a very controversial thing for government to try to reintroduce, even though we do need to find ways to mobilise more of the population. So how do we, uh, if you like, square that circle in Australia? Firstly, I think that uh, we're not entirely there yet. We, we do have a large part of the population that I think wants to contribute more to the national interest in, in, in crises, uh, but doesn't does not necessarily have the, the mechanisms to be mobilised and to do it in a sufficiently civilian, non-securitised way. Um, and on the other hand, a lot of the, if you like, the volunteers in our system are the same volunteers who are in this emergency services, the reserved of the armed forces, uh, and so forth. So in a sense, we're, we're at risk of using the same people twice and, and, and we can't do that. I think the way forward in Australia is, as you, you hinted at, I think there, uh, uh, Mikhail, the, um, the transparent democratic framework. So uh, you know, we've strengthened a lot of our national security provisions through not only through legislation, but also as a consequence of very transparent public inquiries. Uh, a so-called Royal Commission uh, into the bushfire disasters uh, last year, uh, constant scrutiny by Parliament on the new legislation that's coming in, uh, a bipartisan committee of the Australian Parliament, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, which tries to break down the politic politicisation of these issues, not always successfully. Uh, but look, in the end, that, that, that risk is there, and I, I would argue that uh, this is really about government seeking to redefine security as being about essentially maintaining an inclusive liberal democratic way of life rather than defining every issue as about emergency powers or, or, or secrecy. Jan Olof, would you like to come in on this? Yes, please. Uh, I think that's a the system that we had in Sweden that we effectively put tear down 20 years ago, it was extremely secret. Even if you made a big hole in a mountain for, mountain, for instance, you couldn't hide that for the people in the nearby. But every shred in the mountains, it was either a stockpile or a hospital. No production facilities or control centers or anything else. It's just stockpile and hospitals. That was everything. And uh, for the ancestors, for MSP, for instance, they work with this planning and what we're doing. No one talked with each other during the coffee breaks what they actually was doing. Only a few persons knew what was doing for each sector or each part of it. There were lots of specialists managing their parts. And uh, everything was totally secret and nothing had been uh, revealed for the public before, uh, before it was uh, put down and plus 10 years or something. Then we knew what how extensive this work was done. Now it's uh, like in Australia, just the opposite. We are using uh, voluntary people. We have a problem with voluntary people because they are maybe work at the hospital or voluntary in the, the home garden on the weekends and also voluntary on other groups which are essential for the crisis preparedness. So we have to ensure that one person only have one duty in the total defense. And then the other part, how do we build this and do it in public? What's happening now during COVID is that we have more or less everything is important. We had then, uh, for instance, uh, prepared for the closing schools. And then MSB made a list of essential working or essential duties that should be open. And that list was discussed all in the public. And of course, when you discuss what's important and then you have to make it robust, you can't do that hidden. So of course, that's a problem. But on the other hand, if you see our enemies, they, they can't imagine what's important in Sweden. So why? why to keep it secret of course we have to have a, we can't reveal everything we do but uh, one service is, is important that is more or less public thank you 
Christian, do you want to want to point out comment on this shortly? Yeah, thank you. I, I certainly would, and thanks for reminding about uh, being being short and concise. That's that's usually necessary. Um, I, I would have picked most of the same issues. Um, I've been quite concerned also, or, or, always about the fact that in in Finland the traditions and the fact that we have had this con continued continuous system for for many 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 decades and did not actually touch it when Cold War ended, also is a bit of a weakness. So we, we've had, had, first of all, a very sort of strong focus on, on national defense. But at the same time as so the globalization sort of um, started uh, creeping in and become more and more important for Finland, we, we started sort of um, securitizing a lot of uh, actually societal and economic functions, like Mika sort of indicated there. And, and I think that really is a problem when, when, when sort of everything becomes critical because you can't, there's no way you can actually uh, ensure the continuity of, of, of everything. There's, there's simply no resources for that. Um, but also because it becomes very vague. And, and I, I think that's one of the lessons learned in, 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 in COVID. I, I don't think we can genuinely actually point out to the sort of successes we had in terms of preparedness and especially balance them with maybe the failures we had in, in, in preparedness because of, you know, this sort of complication of everything being uh, in one way or other uh, critical. And we also had the same sort of practical problem stemming out of this when we we kind of were expected to prioritize things and, and, and frankly speaking, could, could not. Um, and so, you know, this sort of uh, countering forces of sort of more and more emphasis on 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 strategic autonomy, self-sufficiency, because you can't trust anybody else in the world, and you have to have these sort of um, autonomous capabilities that you can count on at all circumstances, has sort of gained more and more uh, importance. But at the same time, we also have this sort of broadening focus on national security. So it is a I think it is a risky combination, and uh, it's not necessarily a problem, but it's something to be very mindful of when we kind of prepare for the next crisis, which might not be a pandemic, and it most almost certainly is not going to be another COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. So I, I pick up a few questions from the, from the chat here. One is uh, specifically uh, directed to, to, to Rory. Uh, about you know the Australian economy has been very driven by migration, by and 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 that has been a, a big part of this uh, sort of Australian economic experience and society and so on and so forth. Now, of course, that migration program has been uh, kind of undercut and in, in some some sorts of. Uh, uh, trouble with especially with the COVID-19 pandemic and so on and forth. Uh, what what sort of Possibilities are there for Australia to rebuild that migration program, and 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 uh, and uh, then I'll, I'll I'll put another one here as well um, on Australia's response to China's economic coercion. Are there any lessons to be learned from that response? How Australia has dealt with that economic coercion for the EU, uh, for instance, uh, which I think it's it's uh, it's a very kind of recent thing of course this this economic coercion now as we as we as we see it perhaps not that reason in, in in fact but at least the the obvious kind of overt coercion now is 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 recent and we follow it of course with with some interest here as well um and and we discuss this in the eu as well so so the sort of lessons there so if rory you would like to comment on that you 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 want on mute you want mute still uh very, there we are, very happy to take the floor on those two important questions. Uh, firstly, on migration, I, I think Australia will still continue to depend on migration long term. I think it's, you know, Australia has been a great success story in migration. I think that one of the difficult questions facing our government is about when and how do we reopen our borders, uh, because I do think that if, um, if the current situation lasts for more than, let's say, another few years, then it's going to have it's going to uh, have fundamentally distorting effects on our uh, on our future growth and indeed on the health of our society. So I don't I don't see an easy answer to that other than to encourage 
uh, government to to have a medium term plan, if you like, to to reopen borders and perhaps to revisit the nature of our migration policy as well. I mean, I think I, I hate to be kind of um, uh, very uh, national interest focused about it, but uh, in fact, the relative success Australia's had in uh, managing the pandemic in so many ways, uh, and I think the the whole idea of Australia as some kind of sanctuary uh, could could potentially be advantageous to a um, a targeted migration program in the future. But going to the other question about Chinese economic coercion, and that is, although our government is cautious with that word, um, I think that is a fair way of describing the way the Chinese government has behaved towards Australia in the past year. Um, what are the lessons? I think the first lesson is uh, to be patient and persistent. Uh, I think it's well, what's fascinating is that Chinese economic coercion has not done uh, the, the kind of fundamental damage to the Australian economy that perhaps uh, China had hoped or expected it would. It's certainly done serious damage to some industries in the short to medium term. Uh, but from in aggregate, uh, the Australian economy can cope with this. In fact, fascinatingly, our, uh, our net exports to China have increased, uh, or at least the value of those exports has increased due to the, uh, you know, the, the price of iron ore uh, in recent months. And of course, iron ore is one of those exports that China for the time being still desperately needs from Australia. So I think patience and persistence. I think that the the foreign interference legislation that I mentioned earlier, the fact that we had hardened our system a few years ago, three or four years ago, frankly, in anticipation of economic coercion, I think that's not widely known, but the Australian government was anticipating that, that economic coercion could happen one day, meant that we took the, if you like, the political amplifier out of economic coercion. It became essentially criminal to act as an agent of foreign influence or, or foreign, uh, if you like, interference in Australia to, to amplify the impacts of, for example, a coercive campaign in our political system. So make sure that your political system is able to cope with uh, you know, the reality that there may be agents of influence or interference uh, and that you have safeguards against that so that when coercion happens, uh, the, the, the debate occurs on its merits and not through some kind of political interference. And finally, um, solidarity. I think the, the challenge ahead still is for a country like Australia to build sufficient solidarity with others, uh, middle powers, democracies, a diverse range of partners in the world, so that we have some kind of shared playbook for responding to economic coercion. And I think those conversations are just beginning. Uh, but of course, as I think observers in Europe know, uh, what's happening to Australia could happen to another country tomorrow. And it makes much more sense for us to build some sense of shared uh, expectations that may even affect China's calculations. Thank you. Thanks, Rory. And I'll put out uh, a, 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 another question here, and perhaps related to this a bit with economic coercion, that's on Nord Stream. And so to to to, the, to our Nordic Nordic colleagues, Christian and Jan Olof, how do you see Nord Stream? There's a question in the chat that whether it's a hybrid threat, actually. It might be. I think that the Nord Stream is primarily to get uh, around Ukraine for Russia, so that they don't have to pay U Ukraine for transition. And of course, it's uh, energy and it's politics. But I think with the southern corridor and the, to get to, to the old Soviet republics of the southern part to Europe, and LNG is making that the Nord Stream isn't that important out of an energy perspective. But of course, it's, a, it's an infrastructure, probably with some sensors and at least for the, the to scan the, the pipeline's function. But uh, of course, it's, a, it's an opportunity for Russia to get into the area and be in the area and have some supervision of it, of course. Christian, do you want to comment on Nord Stream? Yeah, I mean, uh, more or less in the same line. So we, we're talking about critical flows here and um, that could be used to bind our country together, do you think, in terms of positive terms? Or it could be used as a sort of uh, an instrument for power politics and, and to use to coerce Europe and Finland, Sweden, and other uh, Baltic region countries um, to adjust their policies in some matter. 
uh, or, and in the worst case, it could be used to disrupt some, uh, you know, what, what is critical energy flows. I, I don't think it's that especially directly critical to Finland, but yeah, it's certainly not not just an environmental issue, as we we tend to have a um, sort of the official dialogue here. Um, it, it is it is unfortunate, like all of these sort of critical flows becoming. Um, part of geoeconomics, geopolitics, uh, and that sort of grand game, unfortunately. Thanks. And even without that over coercion, when, when it comes to Nord Stream, it's, it already seems to be driving a bit of a wedge in, in, in Europe uh, when it in terms of the debate that we, we follow. But uh, listen, we don't only have two minutes left, so I will start uh, finishing finishing this seminar. I think it's, this has been, been a, a really rich Rich discussion. I'm I'm really happy that uh, that Rory and Jan Olof that you could take part as well in this, and Christian of course, and Sari, and that we could have this sort of comparative um, view a bit on on these things because I, I I very much see that indeed the the kind of the landscape are is uh, surprisingly similar f w uh, with Australia, Sweden, and, and and Finland. So it's I think this is a, a this has been a kind of rich and interesting discussion with you, which we usually usually don't compare these countries that much. Um, it's also clear that we moved on from a world in which interdependence and interconnectivities were seen as as something altogether positive and risk almost risk free to a world in which interdependence and interdependencies and interconnectivities are seen more as a risk, and that there are certain certain vulnerabilities involved with being very dependent on each other as well, both uh, in so in, in in way of of systemic risks. Uh, such as a, a pan pandemic, but also that there are st strategic risks involved where actors use these dependencies and interdependencies to manipulate uh, other countries, not only by coercion, but also perhaps to, to bind them closer to, 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 that, to that actor and, and through that um, affect, influence and, and manipulate. So this is a very different world. We were living in, and it's certainly the the fact that economic security and economic resilience has become much more pertinent is is highlighted in this new in this new um, uh, era, and and I think it was this was something that very much came out uh, up in all all the all the 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 speakers talks here, and that was that was good. So I I've, I'm very pleased with this with this webinar. Thanks thanks to to speakers. Thanks to 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 all others as well. And and we'll close here. It's actually exactly 15 past, so we've we've kept our schedule very 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 nicely. So uh, have a good good rest of the day, and see you see you soon back again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for including me. Thanks. Thank you. Take care.